and a big welcome to everyone joining us here this evening or this morning or late this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, for Jane Hart, our first keynote tonight. I'm really excited to have Jane with us. I know how busy she is. Most of us here in the room are fans of Jane Hart's work and I've been following for many, many years. So virtual applauding is much appreciated. Thanks for leading the way on that one, Joe. We'd like to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters of the Aussie Live 2015 as usual and a big shout out to Steve Hargaden from The Learning Revolution and for loaning us Amy who has been our buddy, our guide all along the way. She does a lot of the background work in getting all the technology to work for us. Of course Blackboard Collaborate for allowing us to use their rooms and we're really happy to do that. And Australia E-Series, if you're not sure what that is, we'll put some extra information into the text chat. We usually have those running on a Thursday evening called Community Connect. And some of our famous Community Connect people are in the room. We've got Joe and Junita and Ness and maybe a few more joining in. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jane to the microphone so that she can start her application sharing on moving beyond e-learning. Over to you, Jane. Just remember to click your talk button again. Can you hear me now? Now we hear you. Go ahead. Keep the talk button on all the time. Just click it once. It's on. It keeps clicking. Is that on now? Yes, that's good. Excellent. Okay, so thanks very much for the introduction, Carol. Um, I'm only going to be able to spend half an hour, as you know, here in the room, so I'm going to have to whiz through this pretty quickly. But um, I wanted to talk to you today about the way that uh, way, the way we're learning is changing. Um, from my particular, for my activities and research, um, what it means for organizations. Now, although my focus is going to be very much on um, learning in the workplace, I think it also, some of it is going to be applicable for those who work in education. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to gain some pieces of information from it that are useful for your own work. And I, we need to think about moving beyond e-learning because e-learning pretty much has been the way that we've been looking at the delivery of training or education for some time now. But I think in some ways there's, there's become a little bit of a problem with e-learning because it's almost become too easy to create e-learning and this has actually led to a little bit of dissatisfaction with people. They are sort of the first generation e-learning, which is the you know, click next type e-learning. They're getting a little bit sort of dissatisfied and frustrated and even angry with it. And I hope you can see that slide that's coming up. I've got my iPad running here, so I can see that it's taking a bit of a time to form on the screen. There you go. Uh, I think that sort of sums, it sums up some of the uh, expressions I'm hearing about it. And everywhere I go, I find people trying to avoid e-learning at all costs. I think um, Clark Quinn, my colleague, summed it up pretty clearly that what e-learning has become for many people now is just some sort of knowledge dumps started up with trivial interactions. And uh, as I say, they seem to be avoiding it at all costs, you know, trying to circumvent it wherever they can. And in fact, I'm even hearing about some people that are even paying their children to do it for them, particularly the sort of compliance stuff in organizations where they have to sit at their desktops for like two or three hours working through a course and they can't move off the screen so they have to stay there for like 20 seconds or 30 seconds and they find it very frustrating. So they're moving, getting their kids to do it for them. But meanwhile, I've been finding that people are very much doing their own thing. They're kind of, as I said, bypassing a lot of the stuff that's been produced in organizations and learning for themselves. And this has become clear from a lot of the work I've been doing with my top 100 tools for learning activity. 
And I think many of you know all about this now, so I won't say too much about it, just that it's now in its eighth year, and where I ask learning professionals from all around the world what tools they're using for learning, either for their own personal learning, or for teaching or training others. And of course, although a number of e-learning authoring tools appear on that list, as well as a couple of learning platforms, notably Moodle, this year's list, like all did by free online social tools, just like the ones that are appearing on this slide that should be appearing on your screen very shortly. And um, it may come as no surprise to you, or it may come as a surprise to you, depends if you've seen my list before, but the number one tool for the last six years has been Twitter. And um, when I talk to many conferences and workshops about this, people query what Twitter's got to do with learning. They don't see it as a learning tool. And I say, well, actually, it's probably not got an awful lot to do with education, although it is being used in education, and it's probably not got an awful lot to do with training, although it is actually being used in training to a certain extent, but it's got everything to do with learning. And it's really one of the main tools that is changing the way that we're thinking about learning and the way that it's shown to be very different from traditional sort of instructional approaches that we've taken up to now. So when I ask people to contribute to the list, they also tell me a little bit about what they're doing as well. So here are just five ways that I've identified people are using tools like uh, Twitter and the rest of these tools on this slide for learning. So here's just five ways. And the first way that really is significant is that they are building their a trusted network of colleagues around the world in these social networks very diverse networks for people in different areas and different geographies and from different backgrounds to create their own personal learning network and I'm sure that term is very familiar to you so I don't really need to explain too much what that means but for many this is their go-to place um, for so then for their needs, instead of perhaps going and buying some content, they'll ask their network of content, uh, net, network of colleagues first. You know, how, can you help me? Where should I do this? How can I find out about the other? And brainstorm and generally have conversations with their people. And I often say that, you know, I couldn't really be doing the work I'm doing if it wasn't for my network of colleagues around the world with whom I keep in constant contact and I'm able to keep an eye on what's going on in the busy world of workplace learning. And of course, the other way that people are using these tools is now to keep up to date with what's happening in the industry and profession in very new ways. So instead of relying on an annual trip to a conference somewhere around the world, they now have a constant flow of information coming to them on a very regular basis through blogs and web feeds and, and things like that. So once again, you know, these tools are really important to me and my work, keeping up to date with what's happening out there and, of course, sharing it with, with others too. And the third way, of course, that I see people using these tools is to solve, solve their own performance problems. If they're sitting at their desktop and they have a problem, for instance, they're using Word or Excel and they don't know how to... Uh, to solve a problem, well, what do they do? Well, they won't probably go to the LMS to find out uh, how to solve their problem to find a course, or they probably won't even contact their learning and development department because that's probably likely to send them on in a course that's going to happen in the three or four weeks' time. What they need is something to solve their problem just right now. And, of course, just like you and me, they'll go to Google and probably find some solution like a YouTube video or whatever. Uh, sort out their problem and then get on with their life. So they don't sort of hang around studying the stuff. They just want to meet people who would like to use a variety of instructional information resources for their self improvement and just going out and using a variety of resources to uh, find out more about subjects or perhaps begin a discovery of a completely new body of knowledge or and even a new skill. But they're using very different sort of resources to do that. They might go on a MOOC, for instance, a big course, but they could easily just do that from looking at a few videos, like 
or the Khan Academy or some inspirational speakers at TED and some, something like that. And then the fifth way that in particular that they're using it that are in the workplace is they're using these co tools, uh, collaboration tools to work and learn together in their teams. And they're often doing this because their enterprise software doesn't actually offer the functionality that many of these free online tools do. And so they're really actually bypassing their IT departments and solving their own um, infrastructure by using these tools that are in the cloud. And this is really uh, quite uh, significant because, as I said, what's happening is that these tools mean that people are bypassing L&D because they can solve their problems much more quickly and easily using these tools. And, and they're also bypassing uh, IT because they have easy access to these tools and often using them through their own devices. But learning on the web is a very different experience for many people. And uh, one I wanted to talk to you is sort of some of the key things that I, the key features, if you like, of the way we're learning on the web and how it differs from traditional training or education. And because I think this is really useful to think about the ways we need to think about the future of learning in, particularly in the workplace, but also as I said, in education. Now, I think um, the first uh, example, or the first feature, if you like, is that what we, how we learn the web tends to be fairly unstructured. Some call it nonlinear or exponential learning. It's very much about building up pieces of knowledge rather than acquiring them in some sort of structured linear way, as the case with like, most instructionally designed learning or e-learning or training courses. We build just build many bits of knowledge and making sense of it as we go along. It also is a continuous process. You know, as I said earlier, people are benefiting from a, a constant drip feed or, or flow of information or conversations with colleagues, all of which over to amount of knowledge and shared experiences. And uh, that, of course, is very different from training, which is very event-based and packaged up. With, and I can just see that. Uh, slide building up there, so I'll pause for a minute until that's appeared if I move on. But uh, this whole approach to Kiskin is uh, something we all aspire to. And uh, it's also a um, very green landscape. Yes, that's uh, probably a British landscape there. One hopes, anyway. So you of, of learning something, and it, it's just coming to you as well. It's not actually you having necessarily to go out and get it. It's just coming to you. And of course, it's also on demand. You know, when people are faced with a learning or performance problem, they just look for quick and easy solutions, as I said. And they don't want to take a course to study that problem. They just want to solve it and get on with their work. And they also don't need to take a test to know whether they've understood the solution. They they know if they've been successful because they'll solve their own problem. And they don't need to remember the content just of where to find the resource again. Or even the bookmark it. They don't actually need to remember where to find it. So it's not about knowing lots of stuff now. It's more about knowing where to find lots of stuff and how to get quick and easy access to stuff. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, learning on the web happens in short bursts. People tend to make use of short bite-sized, sort of snackable pieces of content, both instructional and informational, as well as have sort of brief conversations and interactions with other people. So they tend to avoid long, drawn-out courses that take time to work through, which, of course, is how a lot of training or e-learning in the workplace is designed around hours of content rather than short, small pieces of, of, of snackable content. And the, People are learning not simply with or alongside others, but from the shared experiences and ideas of others, both in the professional learning networks so of those trusted connections that each of them will have built, but also from the resources that have been freely and willingly shared by others on sites like YouTube and SlideShare and so forth. And when, of course, we talk about social, people think about social learning, but of course, social learning is itself nothing new. We've always learned socially. We've always learned from other people. 
but of course the technology now means that we can learn socially, if you like, in ways that never before possible. But I think this whole social element is a big new thing because traditional workplace learning is very much based on content, which has been authoritatively designed, developed, and delivered by experts. But of course, out on the web, it's much more about access to content and resources and ideas shared by peers and colleagues, not just by so-called experts. And the other thing, of course, about learning on the web is very much that it can happen in the flow of work or on the go. People no longer need to actually come out of the workflow to attend by a training course in person or work on a piece of e-learning on their desktop. They can learn as they work on the go, in, in work or outside of work. And of course, this has been largely underpinned by the use of mobile devices like smartphones and tablets and so forth. And learning on the web is also often serendipitous. You know, some of what we learn is planned and intentional. We, we go to the web to find things out. But people are also learn things just by being immersed in those networks by just being immersed in the web and they're gradually assimilating new ideas and experiences in many instances unintentionally and without even realizing it. But of course with training nothing is left to chance. We don't rely on serendipitous learning yet. We must make sure everybody learns exactly what we tell them to. So serendipitous what about within a training or a workplace environment. And finally then, I think for me the most important feature about learning on the web is the fact that it's about autonomy and control of what they do, the relations they build, and how much time they spend on any activity, professional need. So we self-select both the content and the people that we access and connect with. And of course, people that do this are often described as self-organized or self-directed self-managed learners. And again, once again, this approach is very different from the traditional way that we deliver face-to-face -face or online training, which tends to be fairly instructor-led or instructionally designed, highly prescriptive, and where individuals are largely spoon-fed the content with very little autonomy to diverge from that path. And then that whole process is managed for them and they're monitored and tracked to make sure that they carry out as prescribed. So as I said, many people are doing a lot of this stuff for themselves and working around learning development to decide what and how and when they will learn in the way that's best for them, not in the way that's being prescribed for them. And uh, Jane Bozart, who I'm sure you very, know very well, made the point very clearly in a recent article where she was asked to talk about what is changing the game in training. And uh, she said that in the last 15 years, she's been asked what technology she thinks is going to be the game changer. And it comes up in conversations everywhere. And she says that it's not really about the technology that's going to change the game, it's the learners. And they're changing the whole concept of training. And we're increasingly moving towards an age in which the adult worker will not sit still for training that looks just like school, becoming more sophisticated in the understanding of how learning looks and how it happens. So we're going to have to figure out how to provide better performance support in smaller bites, in places easier for them to access, and so forth. And I think uh, Jane sums up the whole point here, that the way we're learning for ourselves we need to think about changes in the workplace. And that's a lot of the work thinking I've been doing with organizations, thinking about how that, what that change might look like. So I wanted to share with you some of my ideas and thinking around this area. And uh, I've been trying to, over time, build up some uh, models for what the workplace learning might look like. And I kind of call this the new, the modern workplace learning. And I'll make it clear that in this modern workplace learning environment, it's much more than just training and learning, e-learning. Now, learning is a, a continuous process that ensures our personal and professional and even organizational survival. So it doesn't just happen through being taught or self-study, but from a far 
wider range of experiences. And training, in fact, represents only a small percentage of how we learn to do our jobs. Uh, that little bit in the left-hand corner there, the courses bit, the learning from instruction, is only really a fraction of what of how we learn to do our jobs. Most of it happens outside of courses in the flow of work. Now we can do that either from uh, access to just information rather than instruction, things that support our productivity and our job performance, but also through learning as a part of working with others in our teams and groups through just general sharing of knowledge and experiences. And of course, also individually as part of our daily experiences in the workplace, and perhaps through self-improvement activities or, or just using the web for professional networking. So although education, of course, if you like, uh, play a major part in the way we learn as a child and growing up through our teens, it actually plays a smaller part thereafter. Most of what we learn as an adult happens through these many other different types of non-taught experiences. And uh, it therefore means that uh, for organisations, they need to recognise that this happens and that it happens mostly outside courses as people go about their daily work. And I think Rob Laber, for, who is the CLO at McDonald's Corporation, some, summed it up pretty nicely. He says the role has shifted over the years from leader of a portfolio of training elements to an enabler of learning. But the interesting thing to note in this diagram here is that there is a strong correlation between autonomy and value, perceived value. In other words, more self-organized for learning, the more value is perceived to have for an individual. And of course, for many in organizations, that word autonomy scares them. It's not really a word they like to hear, but uh, for me, I believe, and as do others, particularly Dan Pink, who has shown in his book Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, that uh, autonomy is a very powerful motivator. And uh, if you haven't read this book, then it's a really great little book to read. It doesn't take too long to read, um, but it really sums up a lot about uh, the way that we need to think about um, motivation in the workplace. And, Dan Pink in his book says, human beings have an innate drive to be autonomous, self-determined, and connected to one another. And when that drive is liberated, people achieve more and live richer lives. The opposite of autonomy is control. And since they sit at different poles of the behavioral compass, they point us to different destinations. And then this is the quote I really like. Control leads to compliance. Autonomy leads to engagement. And Rob Lauber, that uh, CLO of McDonald's Corp, who I mentioned earlier, said that today's CLO has to give up control of the learning process and focus more on creating opportunities for learners to get the information. So it's less about owning the learning process and more about making things possible. So in terms of my diagram here, I think it's not just about designing and managing content and courses anymore but enabling and supporting people in these new ways in the flow of work. So there's two things here, and that's not the, there's two elements, it's not just about content, but it's also about supporting people. And in practice, this uh, means, if you like, um, thinking about new content approaches, for sure, but particularly trying to bring in the content we're creating more in line with the way that people learn on the web, so that micro, short, pieces of content, mobile, so they're accessible by devices, perhaps a focus more on video, which is really becoming a key way that people are consuming information nowadays. So there's a lot we could talk about, about new content approaches, but I think the really new thing is about helping teams learn from their daily experiences of working together. By that I mean, you know, not sort of as part of any course or any program that's in the workplace, but as part of just working together as a team, sharing ideas and resources. And uh, that's going to be a new role for uh, L&D to actually help people extract the learning from the work and uh, support people as they learn for one of, by themselves. And indeed to helping individuals bring the outside in, go out, find out things, and share what they've learned 
at the outside world in their organizations. So the first, the personal learning leads into the social learning. You can't really probably do an awful lot of this unless you can bring stuff in to share with experiences and knowledge and resources to share with your teams. And of course, this, these two, these two areas are biggest challenge uh, for those in learning and development because most of them see their roles as sort of instructional designers creating and managing content. And I've seen organizations are moving slowly along this line. They're going, they're going from courses to resources. That's an easy one for them, but actually taking the next step into supporting groups and teams through social collaboration is probably the more difficult uh, step to take. And certainly the next one into actually supporting personal learning is an even bigger step to take. Now, I could talk a lot about each of these things, but I just want to say a few things briefly before I come to the end here about personal learning. And uh, it's very much about, I think, helping people learn for themselves, rebuilding those skills perhaps that have been knocked out them in education as we've kind of spoon fed them in the past. And particularly in the context of learning on the web, which might colleague Harold Jarkey calls personal knowledge ma mastery or management. And, and he puts it very clearly that PKM is a set of processes individually constructed to, he, to help each of us make sense of our world. In other words, we have to decide what works best for us. There's no sort of one way that we all need to be working and acquiring these skills and, and, and applying them in the real world. It's for each of us to come up with the way that works best for us. But these kind of skills include things like, I've already made, mentioned earlier, networking with others, both inside and outside the organization, discovering new opportunities for learning, but then managing all that information that's coming in, building the filters which are going to get rid of the noise so that we just get the real signal, the real important information, and then connecting the dots between those bits of unstructured information that are coming to us, making sense of it all, which is where the real learning takes place, of course, and then sharing that with our teams and our colleagues and our external networks so that uh, we can help them find out what we've learned and what, we've, what sense we've made of it all. So I think these are new skills that uh, are being built, need to be built. They are happening, I think, in some schools now, uh, certainly in education. At higher levels, I think, again, beginning to see new, uh, new thinking around this, but in, certainly in the workplace, these are really key skills for the future. And so finally then, uh, it, all of this means that there are implications for uh, organizations. They're going to need a whole new set of roles and skills, moving from the instructional designers to information designers and collaboration specialists, and learning and performance consultants that can help individuals work, um, learn for themselves. And of course, we're also going to see that we need to exploit a whole new range of tools. It's not going to be just about using um, dedicated learning tools, but a whole new range of tools from uh, enterprise social networks and so forth. But if with a broader definition of workplace learning and working much more closely with teams and individuals to solve problems, in the ways that best suit the people, I think we're going to see a modern day department taking on a much more central role in the organization. So they're going to be moving away from being order takers, where you just, have, you know, can you create me a call for this, that, and the other, from to trusted advisors, where they're able to provide guidance and support for both ad hoc and continuous performance improvement. So when I talk to organizations around the world, this is really where they'd like to see themselves moving away from just being a training department to really having a, a very much more central part in the business. And I think those L&D departments who are going to be successful in the future will be those that can take on this challenge with just that. So thanks very much for listening to me. I know it's been very short, um, probably not much any time for questions, but if you want to contact or connect with me, in any way, and perhaps we can have any discussions um, uh, outside of this uh, this area, this forum. We, I'd be very happy to answer questions. Here are some of my um, details. I think I've already spelt the, my website incorrectly. It should be www.cflpt.co.uk. That's where you can find all the resources I've talked about today, links to the top 100 tools, and a lot of my analysis that I've just mentioned or spoken to you about today. Uh, 
if you're looking for an email address, it's easy to get me at jane at janehart.com or on Twitter, of course, for us. Thank you really so find much, Jane. Most of the time, wow. actually, for you made us really also think deeply have a tonight. Thank you very Facebook much for giving us your time. I just wanted so to uh, give you a couple of comments that have come through on the text there. chat to take Thanks away with you. Listening. And one was from and, Janita. Uh, she I was hope saying you enjoy the rest of your evening. What you've said tonight was fantastic, perfect for her as a network. Having you guide us has prevented us from the overload of tools. I particularly thought there was so much to learn in here and to think about that my mind was going in 60 different directions at once. And it was really interesting to see the text chat created as you were speaking because it, what you did was you really made us think laterally and deeply about the subject matter. And I know that everyone will be coming over to C4 to see you soon, I am sure. And if there's any last comments, please put them in the chat. We're all saying thank you. So you might want to do that in the traditional way with the official applause so that Jane can see that happening. And look well, like Joe Preston so has a question or she might have pressed the wrong key there. Uh, over to you, Jane, for your last comments. Uh, okay, thank you very much for listening. I know it was very short and sweet uh, um, and uh, sometimes I can go on quite a long time talking about all this stuff but I'm pleased that you found it of value and I look forward to connecting with you very shortly um, in some other place. Thank you again. Thank you, Jane. Much appreciated. If you wanted to stay on and chat, that's fine. We have plenty of time for you if you want to declutter some of the thoughts that you had. And right now I wanted to say thank you once again to Jane and to remind you that there is a little survey at the end of the session when you leave and if you wouldn't mind just filling that in, we would appreciate it. I'll now close the recording.